chemical compounds react according to common patterns of reactivity. And recognizing when a pattern of reactivity is in play in a chemical reaction helps orient us to it and kind of understand what we're looking at and how to think about it. In this course and in this video, we're going to keep things fairly general, surveying three important classes of chemical reactions that are by no means exhaustive, but will give you an idea for how we think about classifying chemical reactions in different ways, either by the states of matter involved in the reactants and products, or by the type of chemical change that's observed, or by what happens as the reaction takes place. And these three reaction types really exemplify those ideas. So let's zoom in on each type just to kind of survey them very briefly. First on the left, we have a precipitation reaction. And this is a reaction in which solid is formed from liquid reactants, often aqueous solutions. That's what defines precipitation. In the center, we have a Bronsted acid base process. And this is really defined by the nature of chemical change that's going on and the transfer of a proton, which we can represent as H plus, from one molecule to another. Finally, on the right, we have an oxidation reduction process. And the appearance of this can take on a number of forms. In this oxidation reduction reaction, there's a color change going on, and there's actually a change in the mass of this wire uh, as the reaction takes place. What really defines an oxidation reduction process is how the reaction occurs. The, the movement or transfer of electrons in the course of the reaction is really what defines an oxidation reduction process. So as we go through and survey these various types, we'll get into the details about how we talk about them, how we think about them, and that kind of thing. Let's begin with precipitation reactions. In a precipitation process, dissolved substances combine to form a solid product. And so if we're talking aqueous solutions, we'll see the aqueous state designator on the reactant side and a solid state designator on the product side. Many of these reactions involve the combination of ions in aqueous solution to form insoluble solids, solids that are not soluble in water. So two ions are combined that when they get together form a solid that cannot be dissolved in water and thus that solid comes out of the solution. It precipitates out, as we call it, and forms a solid. And in chemical equation form, we can represent that just generally, not worrying about charges or stoichiometry yet, M plus aqueous plus X minus aqueous combine to form MX, which is a solid. And we saw a picture of that on the previous slide, a yellow solid coming out of a precipitation reaction. The reverse of precipitation is dissolution. And you're probably very familiar with dissolution from everyday life. A solution forms as solute molecules in the solid phase dissolve in the solvent to form a solution. Solvent molecules surround those solute molecules and, as we, as we say, solvate them. Now, dissolution is distinct from dissociation, which happens for ionic solutes dissolving in water and, and other polar solvents. Dissociation is the separation of the ions in an ionic compound once it's dissolved. As each ion is individually surrounded by solvent molecules, a dissociation of the ions occurs. And you can see a molecular level picture of this down here below. So from the right to the left is a precipitation process, the ions getting together and forming a solid ionic compound. From left to right, we're combining dissolution and dissociation. The solvent water molecules are surrounding the sodium chloride kind of crystal and getting between the sodium plus and Cl minus ions to dissociate them to cause dissociation. And we would write a chemical equation for that overall process as NaCl solid, which is an associated solid compound, goes to aqueous Na plus and aqueous Cl minus after dissociation. It's very common for us to see spectator ions in precipitation reactions. This is because when two ions get together, a cation and an anion to form an insoluble solid, there are what we call counter ions coming along with the really reactive cation and anion that stay in solution, stay in aqueous solution the entire time. And so in this practice problem, we're tasked with writing balanced complete ionic and metionic equations for the precipitation reaction below, whose molecular equation is given. Everything here is an ionic compound, potassium iodide, 
lead to nitrate, lead to iodide, and potassium nitrate. So in the complete ionic equation, we're going to blow up all of the aqueous ionic compounds, not the solid, because that is, is physically an associated ionic compound. But for all the aqueous ionic compounds, we're going to blow them all up into their component ions. So 2K+, plus, 2I-, minus, a Pb2+, plus, and two NO3-, minuses, two nitrates on the reactant side. And on the product side, our associated PbI2 solid, two K pluses, and two NO3 minuses. And as we just mentioned, we've got quite a few spectator ions in here. So we see, for example, K plus, two of them on the left-hand side, and two K pluses on the right-hand side, and two nitrates on the left-hand side, and two nitrates on the right-hand side. And so those are spectators that can be omitted to form the net ionic equation. And the net ionic equation involves the combination of aqueous Pb2+, plus, two aqueous iodides, I minus, to form PbI2 solid in this process. The way we've talked about precipitation reactions so far may give you the idea that a solid is either soluble or insoluble in a solvent. The truth is more complicated. Every solute, even things that we would consider vastly soluble, like sodium chloride in water, has a solubility limit. We can only fit so much solid in there, right? Oh, so much dissolved solid. And the solubility limit is commonly referred to just as the solubility of the solute in the solvent. And it's the maximum amount of the solute that can dissolve in a set amount of typically aqueous solution, as we'll talk about in this course. And so we talk about a concentration. Solubility is a concentration. Um, and so its units are units of concentration, most commonly mass per liter of solution, grams per liter being very common, or various scalings of grams, milligrams, micrograms, etc. And also molarity. The molar solubility is the moles of the solute that can dissolve in one liter of solution. So we use the terms soluble ins and insoluble really to refer to compounds that have a very high solubility limit, much, much greater than one gram per liter. And insoluble compounds is those that have a very low solubility value, something that is close to zero and well, well below one gram per liter. Everything in between, which is a good number of compounds, we call sparingly soluble, and these show up somewhere in the middle. Um, in terms of solubility. One thing we'd like to be able to do is to use solubility, whether compounds are soluble or insoluble in patterns that we see in solubility, to predict the products of precipitation reactions when two, for example, solutions of ionic compounds are mixed. And we can do this using what are called solubility rules. The solubility rules tell us whether a given ionic compound is soluble in water or not, based on the ions within the compound, based on the identity of its ions. And on this slide, you see a table that lists various classes of soluble ionic compounds. These are compounds that have very high solubility limits that, under reasonable normal circumstances, will dissolve completely in water. And so if we go back to dissolution and precipitation as kind of the reverses of each other, soluble ionic compounds cannot precipitate out, will not precipitate out, but will dissolve in water from the solid state. And so none of these, another way to put this is none of these compounds represented on this slide will be the products of um, precipitation reactions except for the exceptions listed on the right, which on this slide list insoluble compounds involving these ions that are exceptions to the rule that all of these are soluble. So I won't go through the details on the table. Just, all I'll say here is to read this, realize that this is saying that any compound that fits this description is soluble in water with the exception of these over here. For example, absolutely any halide salt is soluble in water with the exception of salts of silver plus, AgCl, we actually saw that previously, Hg2 2 plus, and Pb2 plus. These are insoluble halide salts listed on the right-hand side. On this slide, we have insoluble compounds. And so, in essence, what this table is saying is that any compound that fits this description is insoluble in water 
with the exception of those listed on the right hand side. So for example, absolutely any carbonate is insoluble in water with the exception of salts of the group one cations, Li+, plus, K+, plus, Na+, plus, etc., and ammonia, NH4+. Plus. All hydroxides are insoluble with the exception of BaOH2, the salt of barium 2+, plus, and the salts of group one cations, sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, etc. All right, so now let's work a practice problem to practice applying the solubility rules to predict the products when two ionic solutions are mixed, if a precipitate forms. In, in some cases, if we're dealing with ions that are all soluble in water, all highly soluble, there may be no precipitate. Keep that in mind as you're working through problems of this type. So first of all, we've got potassium sulfate and barium nitrate. And let's list out all of the ions that are in aqueous solution when we mix these two solutions before any reaction has taken place. And I've done that here. So K2SO4, that's two K pluses and one SO4, two minus. BaNO3, two, that's one Ba2 plus and two NO3 minuses. And now in essence, to, to predict whether a precipitate will form, what we need to do is switch the ions, switch the positions of the ions so that, for example, the sulfate anion gets together with Ba2 plus and the NO3 minus anion gets together with K plus and ask whether any of those pairs after the switch form an insoluble salt. In the case, in, in this first case here, K plus is a group one ca cation and, and the vast majority of salts of group one cations are soluble. That was our first solubility rule um, back up here. We can see that here, absolutely no exceptions. So K plus is absolutely not precipitating out. Nitrate, likewise, has absolutely no insoluble salts. And so the nitrate ion will also remain in solution. What about the barium and the sulfate? Well, let's see if we can find barium or sulfate in this table. SO42 minus, salts of SO42 minus are soluble, except for salts of the following ions. And in fact, we find Ba2 plus in that list of exceptions. What this means is that BaSO4, Ba2 plus SO42 minus, forms an insoluble ionic compound. And so what we can say here now is that these two ions will get together to form an insoluble precipitate of barium sulfate. In the second example, we've got lithium chloride and silver acetate. So Li plus, Cl minus, Ag plus, and acetate, C2H3O2 minus. Let's again think about switching the ions and looking for an insoluble salt after we make the switch. Lithium is a group one cation absolutely nothing is insoluble when it's paired with lithium plus, and so that will remain in solution. And acetate um, forms a large number of soluble salts as well. In fact, it's one of these with no exceptions. Acetate salts are always soluble in water. So that only leaves silver plus and Cl minus, and we actually saw previously that these two form an insoluble salt. This is one of the exceptions to the rule that halide salts are soluble. Finally, we have lead 2 nitrate and ammonium carbonate. So Pb2 plus, NO3 minus, NH4 plus, and CO3 2 minus. Nitrate is soluble in everything. We've seen that previously. And ammonium salts are also soluble in pretty much everything. That's actually not listed in the table. Um, except here, ammonium carbonate is soluble. And ammonium nitrate, because it's a, a nitrate, is, is also soluble. So those are out. That leaves only lead and carbonate. If we go back to our insoluble table, carbonates are insoluble and lead is not found in the list of exceptions. So lead carbonate, lead to carbonate, is an insoluble salt. And so we would see a precipitate of PbCO3 in the third reaction. In an acid-base reaction, or more specifically a Bronsted acid-base reaction, a hydrogen ion which we can also call a proton. If you think about the hydrogen atom, one proton and one electron minus its electron to give it positive charge, that's just a proton. So we'll call this a proton in many cases. That proton is transferred from one species, which we call the acid, to another species, which we call the base. 
When you take an acid and you dissolve it in water, water actually has the ability to act as either an acid or a base itself. When an acid is dissolved in water, the hydronium ion is formed, H3O+. When you take a base and dissolve it in water, the hydroxide ion is formed, OH-. And these form as the acid gives a proton to water, gives H plus to H2O to make H3O plus, and the base takes a proton away from water, forming OH minus from H2O. And so the, the figure down here just distinguishes between the dissolution of, in this case, an acid, HCl, in water, and its acid-base reaction. In the same way we distinguish between dissolution and dissociation for ionic compounds, for acids and bases, we can distinguish between the dissolution process and the actual chemical reaction, which is the acid-base reaction between HCl and H2O. And the products of this, after that proton transfer has taken place, are Cl minus and H3O plus. A proton has been transferred from HCl to H2O to make H3O plus and Cl minus. And you can see the complete balanced chemical equation for this process here.